A very warm welcome to, your, uh, to the University of Cambridge Primary School. Uh, my name is James Biddulph. I have the privilege of, of being a teacher at the school. Um, it's, it's been great to, to welcome colleagues from uh, the Federal Centre and uh, colleagues from, from overseas from, from Denmark uh, this afternoon. Um, and I know this afternoon will be a, a rich um, opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about the pedagogy of play. Uh, to help collectively, and, and the school really would like to work with anyone uh, who's excited about developing play for children, for teachers, and for the leadership home to develop a playful approach to all those three aspects of running a school. Um, so it's, it's, I met Camilla when we opened, a few months before we opened the school, um, and Camilla's the head um, of, of a school in, um, in Denmark, and, and Ben Mardell um, from Project Zero. Uh, any of you know about creativity or playfulness at Harvard is the place to go. So a very warm welcome. It, it's, it's a privilege to have you both in our school um, and to be with, with colleagues who we, who we hope to engage with uh, possibly in the future. But over to you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here and we're excited that you're all here. We know it's, I don't know what time it is actually. It's different than in Denmark. Around four o'clock? Yeah. So, um, so we know it's Monday afternoon and uh, we've added a little pictures, but please uh, raise your hand if we need to speed up or anything. But as, uh, as James said, I'm Camilla. I'm head of school uh, of Billund International School. It's also known as the Lego School, uh, but a private independent school. We'll get back to that. And I'm Ben Mardell. As James said, I'm from Project Zero. Um, and we're curious quickly to find out who you are. Basically, I mean, we could ask each one of you individually, for, but we won't, don't have time for that. But I'm curious, how many of you are kindergarten, what we call in the US kindergarten teachers, like preschool, three, four, five year olds? OK, about 41% of you, good. Um, and primary, um, grade one through grade five, I'd say? OK, great. Um, anyone who works with children older than, than that? Is it middle school or high school? Excellent. Um, any administrators? Okay, great. Um, and I know that we have some friends in academia as well. And um, what we want to do is that we're going to first talk a little bit about the problem space of why we need a pedagogy of play. Um, we'll tell you a little bit about our project. Uh, we'll tell you about some principles that we're developing that we think highlight some of the key aspects of what we're learning in our collaboration. And then we'll give you some time to use some of the, our pedagogy of play ideas. So that's the game plan. Um, so to open up, um, I have a video to share with you. And let me explain what it is before, um, for a second. So um, this video is, um, will both, I think, open up the problem space, but sort of um, answer curiosity. Because I actually think that British people are very funny. I love Monty Python, and I'm wondering if that's a reciprocal <laughs> thing. Um, and so I have an American comedian named Louis C.K. Does anybody ever heard of him? OK. Two people. That's great. So I get to share something new with you. Um, Louis C.K. is a stand-up comedian. He lives in New York City. He is divorced. He has two young children. And in this TV show, he plays a stand-up comedian who lives in New York City, who's divorced and who has two young children. And um, in this little segment, he is at a, what we call a PTA meeting, a parent-teacher organization. And the principal is talking to him. And Louis is the kind of red-haired, kind of bald guy with a little beard in the front. So here, let's play it and see what you think.
OK, so at least some of you think that's funny, but why am I showing it to you? Um, I mean, why does school suck? It's not actually that children don't like to learn, right? We come into the world ready and wanting to learn. I mean, the, one of the, main, the main job of young people is to get bigger, both physically and cognitively. And I think everyone likes to be curious and to explore and to invent and to tinker and to work with others to think up ideas and to solve problems and to master skills. I mean, that's, they, those are intrinsically exciting things. Um, I think the reason for Louis that school sucks is that we often separate how people naturally learn, how children naturally learn with what happens in school. And a key part about how kids naturally learn is that they learn through play. And I think that I, I know that I'm probably con talking to, um, preaching to the choir here. Um, and so I'll breeze through this next slide. Um, You'll let press me, the mic. I'll try to, um, okay, yeah. Oh, no? Why is, oh, maybe it's the, ah, there you okay, go. We're, okay I'm, we're both Mac users. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, I think you know this, that during play, children test theories, they explore social relationships, they find meaning, they're engaged, they're relaxed. Play is a central way that children learn. So why isn't there more play and playfulness in school? Uh -huh. And I would say that's not because teachers are bad people. It's not because educators want to do bad things to kids. But I think a key reason is that play in school often isn't a good fit. That there's what you might call some paradoxes between the nature of play and the nature of school that makes it hard to go together. So, for example, play is timeless. When you're involved with play, you lose yourself in play. That's not a bad thing. But school is timetabled. And that's also not a bad thing when you have 300 people that have to go through the day. You need to have some kind of schedule. But when you put them together, it's kind of a problem how to make that work. Um, play could be chaotic, messy, and loud. And we aspire for schools to be somewhat of a place of order. Um, the play involves risks. And school should be a safe place for kids. Um, those two things don't always sit well together. Um, in play, children are in charge. And at school, the agenda is generally set by adults, either the teachers, the immediate people, or people at the Ministry of Education, but again, a paradox. And finally, in play, children create culture. They make rules, they make meaning, they make up new words. Um, school is a place to transmit culture, from learning how to spell words to learning how to analyze and use the scientific method. So how do you bring those things together? Um, in their wisdom, the Lego Foundation recognized these paradoxes and decided to have a research project called the Pedagogy of Play that brought them and people from um, ISB and PZ together. And Camilla is going to tell you a little bit about the school that's the main protagonist in, in trying to create and s understand and work with those paradoxes. So, yeah. do you want me to? Yeah. Okay. Um, no, you're the next slide. But okay. Go oh, okay. Here's yeah, so we are a private independent school, governmental support, um, free within a few limits. Uh, we are an international school. We have 330 students right now, and we are counting 50 different nationalities, also among staff. So it is quite a mix. We have 75 teaching staff members, and this is our fourth year in operation, so we're quite new. What, uh, what we knew when we started out the school was that play was core to the school. It was core to everything we would do, both uh, teaching, living, breathing. Uh, but play is uh, a core to the, to the school for this. We are uh, based in Billund, uh, the, the home of Lego, uh, or the capital of children. So of course, uh, there's a huge collaboration with uh, Lego Foundation, Lego Company, Lego Education, and so forth. Uh, but also, we are so privileged to work with Project Zero in this. And researchers and practitioners coming together is uh, quite valuable and effectful. And I think, uh, I think we will see magic uh, within the next few years. We also an IB school, just to, uh, to understand what we operate within. Uh, International Baccalaureate IB World School, we have been accredited to the PYP program, and we are candidate school for the NYP program. So we are working as fast as you guys are here, um, and making sure to ensure quality in this. When we say we are rooted in a philosophy of learning through play, it goes for all ages. We have uh, students from three years old and soon up to 16 years old. 
So it goes for all of them. So I'm really pleased to see some middle years teachers here as well, because that's where play gets tough. Um, yeah, you can find more on our website. I'll talk more, but note the website and the Facebook there. We have a lot of videos today. We only have an hour together, and we are talkative people. <laughs> so, so do go see uh, some more videos there and, and get more knowledge about us. Yeah? And then you'll share. Yeah, so let me say a little... You. So Project Zero, um, quickly, is the oldest research group at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We're about to turn 50. And we started by trying to understand how children learn through and with the arts, but we've branched out to many different disciplines. We work in schools, we work in museums, we work in organizations. Um, we have about 18 active research projects. And a few things that pull them all together is that we work on the intersection between theory and practice. So we try to bring theoretical understandings, but then help people, practitioners in the day-to-day -day life. And we often work with practitioners to co-construct understandings. We're focusing on creating powerful learning experiences. So really thinking about deep learning experiences for students and for adults, uh, for teachers as well, um, as of really what we're all about. So understandings and un meanings that really can change people's minds and, and their orientation towards their lives. And finally, I would say that many, if not all, of the projects of Project Zero have a democratic flavor, that we're doing this not to educate for fascism, we're doing this to educate for democracy. And that's an important part of our mission and what we're all about. Um, and so you'll get a sense of some of that democratic and co-constructive work and how we're working with ISP. And Camilla is going to tell you a, a little bit about our research process. Yeah. So when we started out this project, we um, open minds and open hearts. When you want to do something, uh, it's good to, to agree on how do we do it? Do we just fail and learn from it? Or do we have to do a lot of PowerPoint and words and big processes? And luckily for me, we did the first thing. We tried it out and then we learned from it. So the first year we started with uh, all teaching staff being in study groups and um, we, we already back then had a feeling of choice was an important part of everybody's learning and, and what we do is also walk the talk uh, and do what we preach. So of course the way I work and, and we work uh, as teachers and colleagues uh, is, is the same way as this. So everyone could sign up for a study group uh, based on interest uh, in, the, in the question. So maybe there was a question about the play and learning environment, play and academics and so forth. And the positive side of that was that we had kindergarten teachers working with middle years teachers, uh, sharing the same question and, and, and getting different findings. The tricky part of that in the school was uh, time to meet, uh, time to integrate and, and how you could speak with your closest colleagues about it. So the year after this year, this is how young this project is, we uh, decided that it was easy if, if all teachers were in class teams. So they worked uh, per grade level, and, and then they had to agree on a question. It made it way more easy to, um, to implement and to, to learn from it. And also, I think being in a study group time-wise, uh, it's the most valuable part for teachers. So time was crucial to this. But this year, it's, it's been really great. The downside to both first year and second year has been that not everyone is equally motivated. And I think it's just part of life. So, so next, I mean, they like it, but, and, and some of them have three kids at home or some of them are newly educated and have so much in their mind. So we, we've decided that next year, it's, um, they, they have a choice between joining a study group, very intense, just like this year, we believe we'll ramp it up a bit, or they can participate in three annual workshops uh, when Project Zero are in town. And I think it will add quality for all staff, uh, but we do it differently. And I'm sharing this process with you because the finding we do have is that one size does not fit all. Mm. And we have to keep working on how do we make the best, best uh, impact at school and also how do we motivate the right people to, to do it. Yes. When uh, teachers join, they get, um, just saying, <laughs> 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 for the administrators, we do assign some, uh, well, not a lot of money, but they get uh, a little payment for it. And also they have uh, a time uh, or a lesson per week timetable to focus on this. They have meeting time to meet with workshop um, groups and with Project Zero. 
So it's an investment. You can't change the world without investing in it. So, so it's also a deliberate choice for me to give time to it. So they meet with them also on Skype per month, uh, one meeting per month um, with Pisetters. And then, of course, they share their findings at all staff meetings to uh, generate ideas, and we will continue to do that, even though they work in two different uh, levels, if you can put it like that. Yeah? So that's the problem space and then who we are. And so let me share, we're going to start now sharing some of what we've been finding out over the past couple of years. So we're first going to go through a list of eight principles that we've been iterating and thinking about for this past year. They're in draft form, but I think we're sharing them because I think they may be evocative and put your mind around how um, play and playfulness can have a bigger role in school. Then Camilla is going to drill down into one of these principles and talk a little bit more of it. Um, I'm going to share a story from a second, a first grade classroom uh, at ISB that will illustrate one of those principles. Um, so that's what we're doing in this next block of time. Um, Okay, so our, our eight principles begin with that um, it, our pedagogy of play involves playing with an educational purpose. That playful learning is often situates curricular goals, context, and activities, as well as learners' lives and interests within a larger purpose or inquiry. So there's an educational reason to bring more play and playfulness into the situation. Second, we believe that a pedagogic play involves lead, learners leading their own learning. That taking playful learning seriously means tipping the balance of responsibility for learning towards the learner. Playful learners are intrinsically motivated to test the limits of, of their abilities without fear of failure to reshape the world. That experiencing choice, wonder, and delight is part of what playful learning involves. And Camilla is going to talk more about what we mean about what is choice, what is wonder, and what is delight, and how does that involve um, invoke playful learning. Um, that involving a pedagogic play often involves connecting life inside and outside the classroom for students, but also for adults. Um, that learners reflecting on playful experiences is core to a pedagogy of play, that it could be before, during, or after learning experiences, but for really to deepen learning through play, the learners have to reflect. That this involves not only children, but adults. So cultivating a culture of playful learning for adults is part of a of pedagogy of play. That um, there's a parallel between the adult and the child learning culture, and so to have this happening for the kids, we need to be having this happen for ourselves that a pedagogy of play involves fostering trust and welcoming negotiation of rules and policies, both in the classroom among teachers and children, but also in the staff room among teachers, colleagues, and, and the administration. So there's, um, there's trust among these people, and there's also a question, there can be thinking about how the rules might evolve and change to better support learning. And finally, that a pedagogy of play involves collectively studying the paradoxes between play and school. So I named those, and we believe that what to get a pedagogy of play, to bring more play and playfulness into schools, it involves a group of educators working together and looking at their teaching practice and thinking how the, about how this works in order to help everyone navigate these paradoxes together. So, that's what we have so far after um, a couple of years. And Camilla is going to delve into this yeah. third principle. Let me just see what I've got this part. Yeah. And oh, oh. if you can't, if um, <laughs> it's, this graphic is on your table, yes. Yes. So, so um, we look at the indicators, and that's what we've been doing at school. Uh, we also looked at the principles, of course. But choice, wonder, delight is something we look at um, in many, many ways. This is um, a work in progress. It has had many shapes, many words, fewer words. More will come, <laughs> more will go off. So this is a work in progress, and uh, keep an eye out for it. We will update <laughs> when we have the next version. But choice, wonder, delight are the three words that we keep seeing in a learning or playful learning um, experience. And, and if they're present at the same time, then we can name it playful, is so far our conclusion. We look at what does it look like, 
but we're also trying to figure out what does it feel like, because that can be two different things. And what's playful to one may not be playful to another. We see maybe one of the older students who found it very, very playful writing a, an essay, where someone else would have found that very, very boring. So it's not for us to judge who's doing that, who's doing what, but we can see that if choice one and delight is present, they're more likely to get this experience. Uh, some of the words you see in there is the choice, it feels like empowerment, autonomy, ownership, motivation. And, and I think if you look at motivation, it's very important that, that we use that from the play and bring it into school. I know the paradox is there, but we can see that just a little thing like having a choice is, is making you work harder and have more play. But the smiling, the laughing, the humming and so forth, these are things that we both observe, but also things that we use when we plan. Um, from my, my own perspective, I use it when I plan a staff meeting. I, I know that I have certain goals that I want. Maybe I want things to be discussed. We need a decision on this, or I need uh, everyone's input on a third thing. Uh, so I look at this when I plan a staff meeting. I'm thinking, how do I, how do I make sure that there's, well, an element of choice? Uh, how, do I, how do I make them wonder about what I need them to wonder about? And how do I make sure that they have a good time? Because we know that this is how we learn best. Play is how we learn best. So how do we make sure that we get that uh, also for adults in a staff meeting? It's, it's a wonderful challenge, and, and I must say, it's, so far it's working out great. They are very productive. We are there from five to eight. They have a good time. They're still laughing when they go home. It's not a stand-up comedian show, not at all. It's super serious play and super serious business. But the choice, wonder, delight, when we have those elements, it's a good feeling. Mm, yeah. We will get back to this, and you'll try and work a bit on it in a few minutes. So I'll let yeah. you uh, do yeah. the handover to that. So the idea now is to share an example from ISD that will help you, mm. um, give you an opportunity to test drive these concepts of choice, wonder, and delight. And um, yeah, there we are. Um, because I think. In my mind, this, that's, this sheet can be very helpful for educators who want to bring more play and playfulness into school because it gives you a sense of what are, what are we talking about. And if you're, of course, in your school, you may change some of these things or you may add some words or you may scratch some things <coughs> out, but it gives you a basis of, you know, so what, is, what are our goals if we're trying to bring more playful learning in? So I'm going to share a story from um, the first grade. Um, and then give you some time to make sense of it using these. Yes? Can you just remind us about what plays your first grade is? So they are These seven are seven. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I have to roll back a lot for that. Okay. Seven. Okay. okay. And this story is called Playing With Money, Playful Learning Meets Curricular Goals. And I'm going to read most of it because it's in the voice of the first grade teacher and a, um, and a Project Zero colleague who wrote this together. So, um, but the story starts off. Um, with um, this picture that a father actually drew about a conversation he had with his son, Arav. Oh, yep, here we go. Um, and Arav and his dad were at the store, and um, his dad brought out his debit card, and Arav was like, Dad, don't use the debit card. Don't you know you're going to pay a lot of interest by using the, credit, the debit card? Use your credit card instead. And then a conversation about family finances ensued. Um, and so I think it's kind of interesting that a um, seven-year-old is talking about these things with fi family finances with his dad. And the reason this came up with was that several months earlier, um, Arif had been part of a six-week unit of inquiry about money in his, in his first grade classroom. So, um, and here are Arif's two teachers, Ida and, and Mark. And when they began planning, their, uh, this unit of inquiry, um, they had a number of curricular goals um, for maths um, um, and for um, the central idea about understanding purchasing choices, um, social studies learning goals. Can you see these okay? I don't have to, okay, good. Um, so that's what their learning goals were and they thought about how can we engage and help students how learn and meet these uh, objectives by learning through play. Um, and so the first thing they did was that they asked the kids to create their own currency, which they called ISB dollars. Here's um, some denominations. And that quickly got um, kids 
thinking about what makes a currency and why currencies are needed helps students explore one of the conceptual math understandings. Standard units allow for a common language to identify, compare, order, and sequence objects and events. Um, and they had fun designing the money and then when they had this money, <coughs> Ida asked the students, what are we going to do with all this money? Um, and the students suggested that they could earn their ISP dollars um, by um, doing classroom jobs. So um, Ada thought that would be a good opportunity for students to learn about the value of earning money and how much things were worth, as well as practicing thinking about a bar graph in an authentic way. So they created a salary scale. Um, some things um, were, um, had more responsibility, so it got more money. Cleaning the toilet, toilet manager, that's not very much fun. So that gets more than being the line manager. Um, and so um, they created this way of, of uh, this, um, this salary scale. Um, and that was a big hit. So um, asked um, kids who had to figure out, they, they got a stipend just being part of class, but then they got money for doing their jobs and one of the interactions was a student figuring out that he got five um, ISB dollars a week and in addition he got ten dollars for being the snack manager and he did that math conception, um, computation in his head and realized he would get fifteen. Um, but the salaries were a big hit um, and um, Arav declared that Friday was his favorite day because that's when he got uh, his money and he was keeping track <laughs> of how much money he was making. Um, so with the earnings coming in, you know, where are you going to put your money? And um, Ida gave kids a provocation that they could make their own wallet. She shared a YouTube video that showed about wallet making and here's Arav with very proud about his wallet um, and where he was going to keep his money. Huh? Um, um, but there was then a question, okay, so you have money. Um, you could put it in your wallet but th ultimately that's not going to be that fulfilling. What are you going to do with your money? Um, and um, the students actually proposed to Mark and Ida that they create a shop. And the teachers accepted that idea. Um, but they said, you know, what's going to go into the shop? And the students had a solution. They said they could um, sell things, um, they could bring things in from home that they didn't want, and they could also um, um, make things and, and then assign prices to it. And, of course, the teachers were going to ask parents whether they were bringing in things that the family really <laughs> didn't want. But, um, so, um, so they had to add shop manager to their salary scale. Um, and in anticipation of the shop opening, um, Miguel asked this question of Ida. Um, when is Thanksgiving, the American holiday? And Ida replied, Thanksgiving is on Thursday. And Miguel was very excited because that means it's Black <laughs> Friday. Um, so I guess some of you know what Black Friday is because things in the shop are much less. And that was an opportunity for the teachers to introduce percentages. So the teachers and the kids decided that on Black Friday everything was going to be discounted 50%. But then you had to do the math to figure out what is half off on, uh, on those prices. Um, there was a lot of negotiation in the shop, both in terms of you know, the social stuff. In this interaction, um, the shop manager, um, um, uh, one boy forgets his money um, and the shop manager ha takes a very firm line with him <laughs> that um, he has to go out. He can't come back. He has to go back into the queue. Um, so, um, um, but also um, in, in paying and making change and figuring those things out, the kids did mostly the, that mental math which was, um, w was, um, uh, can be a challenge for, for first graders. So, um, and here's um, the, the shop manager making some change for, for kids. Um, um, and, um, you know, there's some issues, other issues that came out, um, um, you know, you run out of money um, and so the class actually created a bank. Um, um, but if you borrowed money from the bank, another thing the teachers introduced is that you had to pay a 10% interest. So um, kids had to learn about that. Um, um, there was also the creation of credit cards. Um, and here's your P2 ISP credit card that you applied for. Um, um, and it led to, I think, kind of interesting that kids would realize how to, I would say, game the system in terms of their bank accounts. And um, so uh, Rhea asked um, that she puts money 
it, in at the end, because at the end, if you keep saving, you'll get more money. Emily says, unless there's something you really want to buy. Alan says, yeah, then you go to the bank and take your money out. And Meta says, oh, unless you don't have enough, then you use your credit card. Um, but you pay more back later. Um, and But I, I, it's not in this quote, but um, that kids would um, deposit their money on Thursdays so that they would get their interest, um, um, and then they take their money out after they got their interest payments. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but as Arif suggests, they're keeping the store because they kept it up for several months because they just enjoyed um, the process of, of it, and they continue to learn um, about math from it. Um, so I'm going to pause here and give you a chance to think about the third principle that Camilla dived into about, so where do you see choice, wonder, and delight? And you can pair up or talk at your table if you have fewer people, but spend a few minutes and test drive this concept in terms of this story. And, and um, you probably won't see all of the, the indicators, but see which ones you do see. Um, and I'll stop talking so you can say, to care a little bit. I forgot to tell you that in a past life I was a kindergarten teacher, so I still have some of my <laughs> tools in my trade. Uh, we're curious um, if anyone saw any aspects of wonder in this story and where you might have seen that. What? They invented. And so where, uh, what do you want to, what they, they invented? They invented their own currency. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. They're improvising because they're, they're making the, once the money was spent, they were then creating a system of creating more money or loaning money and uh. the debt and the uh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's very true. Um, we could go through all of these, but instead, um, because of time, uh, we want to give you actually a chance to use these ideas um, thinking about your own context. So on your... Um, table, there's another handout um, which is called the Playful Learning um, Possibility Planner. We like peas in this project, um, um, the letter, not the food, but we, we have nothing <laughs> against the food either. Um, and here's the provocation for you. Uh, think of something in your teaching practice. It could be a lesson that you're going to teach tomorrow. It could be your meeting area. It might be a unit of study that you're going to introduce in a couple of weeks. It may be a staff meeting that you're going to lead. Um, and use this document to think about how you might infuse more play and playfulness into that learning experience. How there might be more choice, wonder, and delight that are brought, made possible for, for your students. Um, and take a few minutes to think through, I think about that issue that you want to think about, think through and think about how you might do it using the planner. And once you come up, it's not going to be a detailed plan, but in a, you know, five minutes when you have something, turn to a colleague next to you and share your problem space and what you've come up with and maybe get a little bit of feedback. And then after about 10-ish minutes or so, we might, we're going to ask for some highlights. But is it clear what um, the provocation, what you might do to think about these ideas? Okay, go play. <laughs> So it might have been that you all had amazing weekends and were sharing what you did, but it seemed like there were some really good conversations going. And Camilla and I are, are curious to hear if there was anything that, any headlines, anything that a few, we, we can harvest a few thoughts of, of how you might use this. Six, eight thoughts? Oh, we have eight minutes left, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we really can just hear a few of them because we have a few last words we want to share with you too. So. about if you let children go and 
you could intervene in a scenario that mm. actually could be through some very powerful negotiation. Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. to decide as an educator to step back and allow that democratic resolution to happen. But from dusk until now, I think you require excellent trust of your young people. So you, without trust, you can't build more trust. Yes, and that's one of why it's one of our key principles. We feel mm. that that trust has to be there. But, but not as a word, you're right. Yes. It's just a baseline. Other reactions or specific things that you were thinking about? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Oh, cool. Nice. That's good to hear. Do we have time for one more? Yes. Okay, we have time for one more. I'm going. Yeah. Or we can go to last words. We will go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, when we are the researcher and the practitioner uh, working together and sharing thoughts and so forth, we also try to split it a bit. Um, so this is going to be very concrete for you guys if you want to explore this further, then um, what I think about a lot is how do, you know, what happens when we, when we put play at the center of schooling. And um, first of all, we need to make play visible. It's, it has to be visible in everything we do. Um, so when you look around your own school, you can see is it visible. It's also about teachers taking risks. We use this making mess, saying yes, standing back, standing up, role modeling, doing it. If we don't do it, then why should they? Um, and take risks with your students. Dare to fail. Uh, I'm sure your principal will have your back when you fail, and you will learn together how to improve. So, so taking risks is um, quite important for us at ISB. And here comes a very important part as well, engaging parents in this. Because I think we can all agree, and the kids will agree, but we will all have parents out there having a voice and an opinion. And they know about school because they went to one. <laughs> so they know what's cooking. Uh, we engage parents at quite a high level at ISB. Uh, the units have a length of six weeks. Mm -hmm. So every six weeks we have a very informal show and tell in each classroom where the parents come. There's a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, no biscuit, but coffee, tea, <laughs> we have. And, uh, and the parents come in at around three. Then the students show them their classroom. And they tell their parents, so we work with this what we learned and so forth, um, sharing the documentation, all the, the processes they've been through, the students are doing that. The parents are also part of assessing the students when they get to this. So a parent can be given a sheet by uh, the teacher and then they have to ask their child, so um, tell me about democracy. And then the first grader is really sharing a good story. But it's up to the parents to, to assess the child as well as we do it. That gives us a very, very clear and transparent and more fair view of a child and their learning. Um, so it's not just the teachers who don't listen or didn't hear and so forth. Twice a year we have a parents-teacher conference as well. We have um, the more traditional one where the parents sit with the teacher and the, and the student and, well, quite traditional. End of the year we have a student-led conference where the student prepare for an hour. Uh, or not, they prepare for longer, but they prepare an hour mm. for their parents. So parents shows up, and the students have then selected work throughout the year. They have been through their uh, portfolios, selected pieces from every unit, and then they've made an agenda, and then the parents come, and, and we're there. I tried it as a parent last year, and just listening to my son for an hour, mm. I must admit that was a new thing. Phones out, mobiles out, other thoughts out, just listening to my child and him telling me what did I learn this year. It was mm. quite amazing. And the students um, are well prepared and they love sharing, just like we do. They love sharing. Another thing is um, parents' universities. Uh, four to six times a year, we uh, invite the parents to play, to learn how to play, to learn the way we do. 
So we have many workshops. We may have when Ben is in town or others. Mm -hmm. Then he gives a speech to the parents. We really like when it's an external uh, voice supporting our message. So we try to open the doors a lot for our parents. Uh, and you can see they are also playing and engaged. And, and we really, really want to walk the talk with them as well. They do not understand it unless they try it. So one of the pictures here is also a cooking competition that the students actually planned, uh, where the parents was giving a variety of stuff and had to make the best pancakes. So it was a competition. <laughs> but the students was leading it, and the parents was there having to collaborate with people they did not know that well, just like the students sometimes. Uh, so they had exactly the same experience. And they did also see choice, wonder, and delight uh, in the process. Mm. Um, we also have heavy discussions, or not discussions, dialogues, heavy dialogues mm. like you do at school with the parents where it's important that they hear the opposite. Not from me, but from another parent. They have to know how much they disagree. <laughs> it's very, very important that they disagree. And I know they do. But it's important that they get together and that it's a safe um, and a environment of trust also for the parent. So yes, we have a lot of uh, engagement with the parents. We have a lot of things with them. And um, we like exploring new ideas. And we do it with passion. And I'm now warming up to our end of uh -huh. this because um, the passion is, uh, is something we've worked on this year. We tried. There was an idea brought to us that we talked about passion and the way Google is doing it, handing out or giving free, setting free 20% of an employee's time so they can think free and not having to deliver. And we were asking ourselves what would happen if we give that to the students? What will happen if they get time on their own and where they can explore their passion? What can we learn from the students and where will they go? So having a school with uh, 75 teachers who are dedicated, well prepared, asking them to let go, open up for the students' passion, not having a plan to follow 300 students, quite <laughs> a lot with uh, additional needs. <laughs> uh, we just had to, to uh, keep the stomach very calm and then <laughs> think the worst thing that can happen is that we have fun. Uh, so the day came and it was a lot of fun. And it was calm. We only had two rules. And the rules was be kind to each other and respect the environment. And they did. They had a wonderful day. The first passion day was a um, lot of fun testing out. The second one was uh, better because we were more aware about choice one a delight. And we could push some students to do more. Um, and the third one was even better because then we started to challenge and we say, if that's your passion, then then why don't you try this, or have you considered, and so forth. We can facilitate, we cannot tell them what to do. And, and if you have a, a boy coming up saying, I would like to play soccer for Passion Day, like good for you. You want to play alone? And they're so used to us fixing it, that we would gather a team. No, he didn't want to play alone? Okay then. Then you go out, and then he had to fix the team, he did to make the, had to make the plan, and a few of the rules he also invented. But it was him, and he was super proud. So it's just, mm -hmm. yes, they have an idea, but we have to push them to take it further. Um, yeah, let me s okay. share this one. Um, You're going to like it. This was, one <laughs> this was one of the groups uh, from Passionate, the first one. Um, and maybe you have to read it, and I'll share with you after. <laughs>
So they learned a lot. And one of the lessons learned is that it doesn't have to be perfect to be a passion. That was the biggest as well. So wrapping up, play, learn, goes together. And we love Photoshop too. Um, so <laughs> um, because this <laughs> hadn't been invented, but um, coming soon on the ISP website is going to be something called the Pop Playbook that um, is primary audiences for teachers new to ISP to learn about what are the principles, what does learning through play look and feel like, what are some practices that you can do through learning through play. But we think it would also be um, interesting to current staff, but also others as well. And it will have um, the story that I shared with you in a larger form, a story about Passion Day, other examples of what learning through play looks like at ISB. So if you're interested, um, it's not up quite yet, but in, in the next month or so, we're hoping, um, you, or certainly by August 1st, visit the ISB website and, and for more information about this. Um, and um, I know that you have beautiful days like this all the time in Cambridge, <laughs> but, but we, we wanted to make sure that you could enjoy another beautiful day. So we're going to yeah. end here, but we're, we'll hang around if you have any questions for us. Yeah. So thanks for coming. Thanks for coming.